Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. This is one of over 900 programs that we've done since the pandemic started, and we hope that you've been enjoying them. And today we have Greg Melville here uh, to us from the East Coast. Um, he wrote a book called Over My Dead Body, and it's uh, about his tour of all the famous American cemeteries and, and also just the history of cemeteries. One of the things that's fascinating about it is how new what we think we take for granted about cemeteries is all, just a couple hundred years old. Uh, I mean, people buried before that, and we'll get into that. But welcome to the Commonwealth Club, Greg. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So um, you had a job uh, working in a cemetery, cutting grass and, and digging ditches and so on, and this is what's your first experience. How old were you? It was before my senior year of college. So mm -hmm. I was 21 years old, working for my, my local Department of Public Works uh, for my town in uh, Bedford, Massachusetts, my hometown. And one of the things uh, you, you mentioned in there is how the, the full-timers didn't like college kids, uh, you know, because uh, this is, I mean, I had a college job just like that too. So why don't you explain that? Uh, I, I probably mowed with a little too much ambition at first. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure why, but it was, I was reminded that it was not a competition and that uh, we, we don't get paid by the acre, uh, we get paid <laughs> by the hour. But that was good because it, it gave me time to kind of slow down uh, mm. and really be able to appreciate the surroundings uh, and for the first time kind of appreciate what a cemetery, the stories that a cemetery tells. I thought one of the things was interesting, you said that people really don't go six feet under after all. Um, <laughs> that's right. I'll use six feet a... under, so, but that, that's just not true. Another, no, myth, it's, another it's... myth shattered. I thought we'd, we'd get rid of that one right away. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it's generally not, uh, except in horror movies maybe. But um, yeah, six feet is just, it's a little too deep. It, it, sometimes uh, graves can collapse at that, at that depth, and also it just takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Generally, they're four to five feet deep. All right, now, this isn't going to be all about uh, death and destruction. This is about, this is about our culture. It's very interesting how many different cultural things began as a cemetery idea and how many, like, especially the capitalistic ideas that got brought in. I think that was, that's really funny uh, how, how people use uh, their financial ambitions in this way. Uh, and, and, and it reminded me of, of timeshare. You know, <laughs> where you take a, yeah. a building, you cut it down into very, very smaller and smaller pieces and then charge three times as much as the property is worth when you don't chop it up like that. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, how you got this idea, other than the fact that you worked in the cemetery when you were young, uh, <laughs> how you got the idea, and then how you, you sold it to a publisher. Sure. So I am a, a travel writer and journalist by trade. And so I've spent the better part of the last 30 years writing about different places and reporting from different locations around the world. Uh, I used to be an editor at Men's Journal Magazine and I've written for Outside and Runner's World and uh, a whole host of different outdoor and travel and, and fitness magazines. And uh, I never could really figure out how to tell the story of cemeteries. And then in the last few years, actually while I was teaching at the United States Naval Academy, I kind of sat down and tried to figure out how to tell the story of cemeteries, these places I've been visiting for the last three decades uh, since I first started working there. And that's when I kind of uh, came up with the outline and the, the sample chapter and kind of the proposal of how I would tell the story of cemeteries. Yeah, and, that's, and, and did you, did you, were your agent able to find a publisher fairly quickly with your background and all that writing and everything like that, or, or, or did this take a long time? And yeah. yeah, so it definitely it definitely took uh, the help of, of an agent. I, I the first the first draft of the proposal that I wrote, the first draft of the chapter that I wrote uh, after I sent it to my agent, she she looked at it. She got back to me about a day later and said, "Why don't we do a picture book instead?" <laughs> uh, so so I was determined that I would not do a picture book, that it would actually be a narrative because I'm a writer. Uh, and so it it did. It took me a few years uh, of back and forth with a couple of people who were very honest about. Um, you know, how to, uh, how my narrative was working and how it wasn't. And basically what I tried to do eventually was tell the story of 
of America through its cemeteries, starting in 1619 and going to current times, mm -hmm. and capturing the arc of history as it's reflected through our cemeteries. Mm -hmm. And then each chapter within, focusing on a specific cemetery uh, in chronological order that somehow played a role in or mirrored in an important way American history at different junctures. And uh, that was kind of when I struck upon that formula, when I was able to tell the story of cemeteries, because I wanted to make the cemetery the, the protagonist, if you will, even mm -hmm. though there are many people obviously in it. And then it kind of fell into place from there. Well, your book is exactly what you just, just described. You know, it's a great arc of history. I also thought it was interesting that the, that the arc also moves from the East Coast to the West Coast, because the, of course, the West Coast uh, cemeteries are younger than the ones on the, on the East Coast, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it makes for an interesting uh, movement, especially through Tombstone. Uh, that was a great little, little uh, diversion before you got to California. So um, why don't you say a little bit about the oldest possible graves? And we, before we get to 1619, you also talk about, on each continent almost, the oldest known grave site. And, and, and so what's going on? How, how far back it is that people have bur buried them, their relatives? Right. Yeah. So obviously human remains, there's a difference between just finding human remains and finding mm -hmm. deliberately buried human remains, right? Mm -hmm. And so the very first ones that we found or that, that archeologists have found is in Israel now uh, in, in a cave called Rockefeller Cave. And inside that, that dates back about a hundred thousand years. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that people were deliberately buried there because uh, they were laid to rest with flowers there were etchings that were on the cave walls. Uh, and of course, uh, there was alcohol there, uh, which <laughs> is fortunately a tradition that has continued to this day as part of <laughs> burial rituals. <laughs> so you're saying that there's, there's nothing new about alcohol at the funerals, huh? No, that was actually uh, one of the earliest incidences of alcohol being found anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so that is not a new thing. Um, so my family are not pioneers in that. Um, although they are very, uh, very close adherents to it. <laughs> so you can feel anybody at a funeral that's drinking a little bit too much can feel that they are, it's respectful. It's, it's ancient. It goes back a hundred thousand years. That's really wonderful. That's right. It's, it's, you're just following tradition. a sacred tradition. Yeah, basically. there you go. Um, tell that to your wife. Yes. So, <laughs> so uh, the next uh, in Europe, uh, also there's one that's about 33,000 years old. So why don't you tell about that yes. one? And, and so uh, again, they were largely found in caves. Uh, and mm -hmm. so uh, that, that what's also interesting is that uh, in different places, in different continents, including in uh, North America, the graves, uh, the, the bodies were often uh, covered in ochre, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a red powder. And so uh, the, the earliest ones in, in Europe were as well uh, in, in, in Wales. And, uh, and so, yeah, and then in, you get to North America and the, the earliest uh, deliberately buried body is about uh, 12,000 years old, uh, mm -hmm. found in Montana. Interesting, the, uh, let's go back to the ochre for a second because ochre is still used in parts of the world for decorating uh, people. And I don't know if they still decorate their um, uh, deceased relatives that way. But I thought that very interesting that, that ochre as a decoration goes back 33,000 years at least. So, yes, yes. Yeah. And um, the original graves that uh, even on the, the east coast of the United States, the, the, um, the grave in uh, Montana, that was covered in ochre, but then also graves in the east coast were as well. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, there, there's really no connection that's been found that links all of these different burial traditions on these different continents, yet it is something that we've seen time and again. Yeah, uh, that's, that's pretty amazing since the, we consider those cultures totally separate um, right. from, from a geographical point of view in time. That whatever the tradition was, it must have lasted for tens of thousands of years without any connection with other groups, maybe, you know. Right. So, right. Um, so that's the ancient, ancient stuff. And, and uh, you, you have some very nice stuff about ancient Egypt in there, too, since that's, uh, everybody, everybody thinks about ancient Egypt. We actually have a program on Friday on Ramses the Great because we have a big exhibit here from, from Ramses. But the, just the Egyptians uh, sort of went over the top um, mm -hmm. with their burial uh, stuff. Uh, no, uh, there are a few rich uh, 
Americans who've tried to build pyramids in their cemeteries, but never quite as big as, as, uh, as the pharaohs. Um, that is true. But, but you did mention that embalming was just totally not used at all. Um, I mean, obviously the Egyptians used it, but it wasn't used at all for a long time, and now it, it, it came back again. Well, we'll, we'll get back to that maybe in, in order. But, but I thought it was very interesting, he said, to find out what really happened you know, in, in, when the pilgrims came over and so on. You, you go to the, their, their uh, cemetery and then find out. Oh, yeah, because really those are the, those contain, I should say, really the longest lasting artifacts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these burial spots, uh, a lot of times, in, in a lot of these places, uh, whatever they constructed has long since vanished, but what they put in the ground has remained and gives us so many more clues about life for the early colonists uh, than really anything else. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you found, I mean, what, what you see from the graves that tells us what, what it was like to be a pilgrim, other than that, you know, the death rate was fairly high. Okay, so, uh, and also Jamestown as well, right? Jamestown, right. Um, so, Jamestown too, so, right. So in Jamestown, uh, for instance, uh, and the, the stories of the difficult living among the Jamestown settlers is pretty, um, it is pretty well known, but uh, there were bones that were dug up this century that reveal, for instance, the cannibalism that took place uh, in the early winters there because the living was so desperate within James Fort's walls. Uh, the pilgrims, uh, like the settlers at James Fort, the burial grounds originally were ones of necessity more than anything else. So they buried their dead uh, on unmarked graves in indiscreet or in discreet spots, rather, so that uh, no one could count the casualties from the indigenous population that might be watching them. Mm -hmm. And then what's fascinating about the pilgrims is not fascinating, but pretty it's worth noting, of course, is that they, they survived their first winter off of basically robbing the graves of local indigenous people, mm -hmm. kind of igniting this long history of desecration of indigenous people's graves that has obviously continued to this day. An interesting part about that part of the story, which some obviously is in other histories, but still fascinating mm -hmm. for those who don't know about it, is that the pilgrims weren't the first, obviously, to visit along the coast. And right. an earlier visit from 20 or 30 years earlier had left behind a disease. It was, it was yes. not the usual thing, right? But, but that it had wiped out a lot of people, which is why there were graves with a lot of food in them and stuff like that left behind, because the population had, had dropped by so many, uh, by right. such a high percentage. Right, um, you're absolutely right. They, they say, they estimate that approximately 90% of the native population uh, from basically what today is Rhode Island up until Maine was wiped out by a disease that was brought by traders from Europe. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when the pilgrims arrived, it was almost like a, ga a gas attack had occurred. There were just, mm -hmm. there were all these villages and everything, but no people. Uh, and uh, so they settled in Plymouth uh, basically in a fishing and farming village that had been cleared by the local indigenous population, but was no longer populated because of the epidemic that had run through earlier. Yeah, I think the story is clear that they took over land, but it was seemingly unpopular land. But I don't think what's told often is that the, the buildings were there, homes were there, and, and you know, the, the, the villages were there, and, and their farming mm -hmm. uh, land was there, so that, so that maybe yes. something was going to grow anyway, because you know, even if people have died, plants still keep growing. And in addition to that, they had buried food with the people so that when they found that, then they knew to go look for it too. So yes. that's call all a lot different than the image of, of uh, how the pilgrims survived, I think. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So uh, you tell the story about why the uh, chief, who uh, obviously you would expect the uh, indigenous people to be very mad at the Europeans because I'm sure they connected this death to the European visit in some way or another, I would assume, from 30 years earlier. Um, yeah. So they didn't, didn't want to connect with them. But he, he did end up, you know, helping them survive and everything because he needed them. For what reason? Why don't you tell the story? Yeah. Basically because his, uh, the, the people who he led, they were so depleted by the ravages of disease uh, 
that he needed allies uh, to pr to help protect his people from other enemies that were were in the region. And so he was very quick to make the the, the leader. His name was Usamiquin or uh, Massasoit. He's more commonly known as and and yeah. So he was eager to make some kind of an alliance with the Puritans when they arrived at Plymouth. It also adds another little angle on why he did what he did, um, you know, and why the first Thanksgiving was held together, et cetera. So it was a, more of a, uh, I need allies. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, the burials were simple. They, they just took the bodies and put them in the ground, right? There was, it wasn't an elaborate ceremony, right, at this point. Right. So early on with the pilgrims, uh, for sure, and they were buried uh, basically on a, on a hill that was uh, right along the water. Uh, they had, they've had two burial grounds. The, the very first one was one where uh, they kept it so secret that uh, they ended up growing crops on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then um, <laughs> it was kind of lost to history for at least another century when uh, bones started washing up during a flood. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but that was for the, really the first few years. And then they established on a hill that was overlooking the, the bay, they established a more formal burial ground after that, which is mm -hmm. uh, still in existence today called Burial Hill. So that's the earliest thing. And then you kind of move to what's the next phase of cemeteries. And I, I thought it was very interesting how public parks and cemeteries were combined, or I mean, I mean, how, how this idea got developed. So I think we're, we're kind of at the 19th century or whatever, you can, you can go where you think the next big stage was. Sure, so the, for the longest time, for, for centuries, basically bur burial grounds, European and uh, North American burial grounds for, with people from, of European descent, they were attached to the churchyards or houses of worship, or they were family plots in large pieces of land. And it wasn't until the 19th century that really cemeteries became untethered from houses of worship. Mm -hmm. And that started in Cambridge, Massachusetts with a, a cemetery called uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery. And actually until that time, cemeteries were called graveyards or burial grounds or burying grounds. Mm -hmm. And, but they had become overcrowded to the point where it was a public health crisis in a lot of cities, including later on, obviously in San Francisco in the, in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And so um, what this one person proposed was to the creator of Mount Auburn was to create a cemetery that was on the edge of town in Cambridge, right across the Charles River from Boston. So it would be close enough for people to go. And he promised that kind of everyone would get a trophy there. Everyone would have their own eternal resting place with their own stone. They could buy family plots. And uh, this was during a time when uh, Unitarianism was becoming really big in Boston. And mm -hmm. people were getting away from the old Calvinist ways. Mm -hmm. And the questions of the afterlife had changed. And so people were kind of looking for, to hedge their bets a little bit, uh, <laughs> to preserve themselves for eternity. And so the idea even of a permanent resting place is, is almost uniquely American in that respect. And so that started there. And, and the other thing is, is that these places, starting with Mount Auburn and then spreading across the country, these rural cemeteries, they were the first examples of landscape architecture in the country. And they were the first city parks because until that time, nature was seen as something to be conquered and not preserved. So mm -hmm. there weren't city parks in urban areas where people would go and picnic and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You talk about one, well, let's, let's back up one second because you had some interesting okay. stuff about George Washington and, 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 uh, and his uh, slaves. Um, and you know, he, one of the things he said was that when he, when he went to, to New York and was cheered, one of the people were, you know, one of the people were from you know, this graveyard, I mean, from the families that were buried at George Washington's place. No? Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, that's it. So, so George Washington and, and then also Thomas Jefferson, and, and one of the chapters focuses on the enslaved people's burial ground at, at Jefferson's Monticello. And uh, 
Jefferson and George Washington both designed their own grave sites and were very deliberate in how they created their memorials in a way that showed uh, how how much they understood the symbolism of a burial ground and how how for generations people would they knew people would visit their graves mm -hmm. and so the contrast of the enslaved people's burial grounds which were found on their plantations only in the 21st century is really striking mm -hmm. and you can understand the conscious choices that went into what was preserved and what was not mm -hmm. yeah fascinating so let's you you mentioned uh in the 19th century we're getting started you mentioned concord yeah. uh massachusetts and uh four very famous writers are buried at, at uh, the one in concord so why don't you talk about that and especially because they were interested in in this back to nature i mean uh thorough is certainly involved in that whole process so right and Exactly, and uh, so was Ralph Waldo Emerson, who mm -hmm. was kind of the, in a lot of ways, the father of transcendentalism, right? Mm -hmm. And this notion of, of relying on intuition and uh, really becoming one with nature in a lot of respects. And so Concord at that time uh, was being, in, in the middle of the 19th century, was being clear cut uh, and uh, was being deforested. It was about 90% deforested for farmland. Mm -hmm. And right on the edge of the center of town was this beautiful forested area where not only would Emerson go, but Thoreau and um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and then the Alcott family would spend time there. And it was a place where they would, it was like their muse. They would go there to be inspired and to spend time in nature. And they were afraid that it was in danger of being cut down. So. Ralph Waldo Emerson led a movement in Concord to create a cemetery there. Cemeteries were so natural at that point without any embalming fluids or tombs or anything like that, uh, really, that were placed in the ground uh, or vaults. So uh, he saw it as kind of a natural extension of the great outdoors and it, kind of the perfect joining of humanity with nature. And the cemetery itself, is really the first conscious conservation project in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, interesting. an interesting element. You, you say that about a lot of different things that happened with cemeteries, that they actually were at the forefront of something that became a much bigger issue in America eventually. Um, right. Something one would not have expected. Um, right. Yeah. Like you take um, Greenwood Cemetery, a rural cemetery that was modeled after Mount Auburn Cemetery. Greenwood is in Brooklyn, New York, and it became this this world sensation. People would travel across the Atlantic to go there. It was the second most popular tourist attraction in the United States besides Niagara Falls in, in mm -hmm. the early 19th century. And p the city planners loved it so much, they they basically said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we created this central park that didn't have any bodies in it? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was essentially how Central Park was created. Yeah, yeah, it's, that that was another fascinating thing. Well, let's let's have a cemetery in the middle of the city, but without any bodies. You know, it's like yeah, it was pretty much it. And you have a great story about Yoko Ono uh, doing her thing for Central Park and the graveyard. So why not, that moves forward, but it's still it's a good place for it. Sure. Tell so, Yoko's story. Okay, so basically today, uh, because there are no burials that are allowed in Man just about all of Manhattan, um, Central Park has become perhaps the most popular burial ground in or graveyard in the city because of people spreading cremated remains there. Mm -hmm. There are actually companies that you can hire to uh, spread a loved one's ashes in Central Park. If you live far away, you can ship mm -hmm. the ashes. And really this kind of started with, with John Lennon. Mm -hmm. uh, when John Lennon died in 1980, uh, it was illegal to spread ashes uh, in Central Park, but it's pretty clear that it was like the worst kept secret in New York that Yoko went to what is now Strawberry Fields, which is across the Central Park West from where they're, the building where they lived were, and she spread his ashes there. And so that really kind of started this idea of uh, 
spreading ashes in Central Park and, and how it became a popular destination for that. So I guess in a way, that's something else you can blame on Yoko. <laughs> well, I thought it was very clever. You, you wrote that she, she donated a million dollars to fix up that part of uh, Central Park and, mm -hmm. and to put down stuff uh, to remember John and so on and so forth. But she also had another idea in mind, which was to, to get all the mourners to move away from the Dakota building, which was causing problems at the entrance of the Dakota for people coming and going that live there, and move them across the street into Central Park. Right. It's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> maintain your home price and still uh, create an appropriate memorial for yeah. John Lennon. So yeah. Nicely done. Well done. <laughs> so... Um, Let's go back another a, a century again and, and get back in the 19th century. Uh, one of the things that developed were, were the national cemeteries. And you said this kind of got started, I think, at Gettysburg. If not, I maybe got started a little before that, but was Gettysburg yeah. a, a funder, founder of it? Yeah. So, so there were a couple before that, like you said, uh, and they were basically put next to military hospitals. But mm -hmm. Gettysburg really was the big one, the one that changed everything. It changed how America looked at death. Mm -hmm. And it really cemented the use of national cemeteries in the country because they hadn't been used until the Civil War. And at the time that Gettysburg was created, at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, basically uh, people in the North in the, the, whose family members were dying for the Union, they were dying really gruesome deaths. And the families were trying to find meaning from that because at that time, the good death in the United States was to die at home, have your last words recorded by a loved one, and then the family members would carry you to the churchyard where you would be, or the place of worship where you would be buried. And so uh, family members were terrified that their loved ones were not reaching salvation because they were not having the good death. And, and, and obviously members of the military were as well. You know, if I'm, di if I'm dying for a just cause, what is, what is my reward? Am I, am I saved? Mm -hmm. And so uh, Abraham Lincoln, when he gave the Gettysburg Address, which was during the convocation ceremony of the National Cemetery, he made the point of redefining the good death mm -hmm. as being one where you die for your country as well. And that's mm -hmm. how he says that it is the people who died who consecrate the ground. He makes it a, a, mm -hmm. basically a holy place and a holy act to die for one's country. Yeah, you, it, you have a military experience yourself. Um, so um, you, you went to Afghanistan, is that what you said, All right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so you have this experience, and yet you, you, you kind of disagree with the, uh, with the uh, old uh, Roman saying um, that's at the Arlington Cemetery. And so why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was, that was fascinating. Sure. Well, I think that, uh, you know, I've heard before it said that uh, any true war story is an anti-war story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, but really, at Arlington, you're trying to, or Arlington from the very beginning has tried to kind of make everyone obviously uh, remember the heroism and and also make it a noble act. And so there's this one saying, dulce et decorum est pro patria more, uh, is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. That is so, so appropriate that is etched above this colonnade where uh, presidents speak every Memorial Day to commemorate the dead. And really, uh, Arlington was created as kind of this Elysian Fields with the very classical architecture where basically everyone who goes there is turned into some kind of immortal hero, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. When you go there, it is just this incredible place. But uh, what I kind of investigate is were we a little too successful, mm -hmm. you know, in saying it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country? Are, uh, do Americans now become a little bit too eager to be willing to put people in Arlington? Mm -hmm. uh, there mm -hmm. are even songs, country songs about how, you know, don't worry for me, I'm in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, well, yeah, we can, we can still care that you're in Arlington. We'd, we'd rather not have you there. The mm. myth mythology that we've created through this gorgeous place perhaps has, has been too good. 
fascinating the history of it too because uh, Arlington belonged to, to uh, General Robert E. Lee. Why don't you tell that story? Because uh, it, was, it was fascinating, the politics behind it and why it was done the way it was done. I don't sure. think very many people know that about Arlington. Yeah, and when you think about it, really uh, all national cemeteries are political in nature mm -hmm. anyway. And the very first battlegrounds, cultural battlegrounds during the Cold War were the American cemeteries overseas in Europe, which right. are these grand, amazing places. But anyway, Arlington was basically created to, to flip the bird at, at Robert E. Lee, whose mm. home, where he was married and where he lived with his wife, it was his wife's ancestral home, uh, to, to make it so they could never live there again. So the first bodies that were buried there were buried around the house so mm -hmm. that the house would become uninhabitable. And it was this massive symbolic gesture that was made towards Lee and the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and sounded like it was done very gleefully. <laughs> yes, it, it certainly was. There was a lot of intent behind that. Yeah. And, and Arlington obviously is a very strategic place. It's on a hill that overlooks Washington D.C. across the mm -hmm. Potomac River, but there was a there was definitely a, a great deal of exuberance that went into um, transforming Lee's plantation into a into a an important place for the Union. Yeah, um, and there was uh, uh, President Kennedy is uh, obviously buried there. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a, there's a family plot up at one of the other famous cemeteries uh, near Boston, and there was a mm -hmm. sort of a competition where he was going to be put. You want to tell how uh, Jackie arranged for that? Yeah. So originally he uh, he had a plot that was in Brookline, Massachusetts, where his parents are are buried. And uh, be, being a Massachusetts person, I actually belong to a running club that used to to run there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, uh, but Jackie wanted him buried at Arlington and wanted he, he's and wanted him to kind of be immortalized there mm -hmm. creating a monument is this huge task that the Jefferson and Lincoln and Washington memorials were all created many decades after the those presidents died and she mm -hmm. wanted something that would be lasting that she could be guaranteed that basically could be guaranteed to be built. Mm -hmm. So she created, not only did she have him buried at, um, at Arlington, but she had him, she created the, the immortal flame or the, the eternal flame, right? Mm -hmm. And that is lined up perfectly with the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument on the other side of the Potomac, mm -hmm. creating this straight line uh, mm -hmm. that, that you can draw from one to the other. And she did not have to go through the political process, the waiting process, the planning process. All she had to do was talk to the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Army who, and President Johnson at the time, uh, because even today, uh, Arlington is still administered by the Army. And uh, so she created this instant monument, which is it's just incredibly remarkable. And it's also yeah. been very important symbolically in cementing his image and place in history. We'll go in that straight line back to Lincoln. <laughs> and Lincoln gave this Gettysburg Address at, at the, the ceremony. Um, and yeah. Frederick Douglass gave a speech at, at the same ceremony or, or, or around the same time? It was one of the first Memorial Day cemeteries, mm -hmm. uh, uh, first Memorial Day uh, uh, commemorations uh, a couple of years after the Civil War ended. And it was at Arlington uh, and it was often forgotten. It wasn't really covered in the press and it was basically a reminder by him to not forget the past and to not forget the reasons for the Civil War and mm -hmm. to not paper over history with other motivations by the South uh, that supposedly uh, motivated the war. Would you like to read it? Or I have, I have a copy here. Do you have a copy easily available? Because I, I think I it don't. was so excellent, you know, and, and you, you, you kind of bring it back from its lost place in history. So I don't have it in front of me. If you, if you want to read right, it, that I, would be I, I have a copy. I'll, I'll read it. Thanks. So this is Frederick Douglass and, and uh, as, as uh, Greg was saying, it's not very uh, well known, but it was called Decoration Day. Memorial Day was called Decoration Day when it first yes. started. Yeah, at that time. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, 
he, he said that, let's see, most poignantly, Douglas made an impassioned appeal. He said the growing movement in the name of patriotism to rewrite history and deny the dark and vengeful spirit of slavery as the war's cause, or to give equal admiration to the Confederacy, which struck at the nation's life to defend slavery, would be to forget the merits of this fearful struggle and betray the noble cause for which so many Americans fought, sacrificed, and died. Douglas concluded, we must never forget that victory to the rebellion meant death to the republic. We must never forget that the loyal soldiers who rest beneath this sod flung themselves between the nation and the nation's destroyers. If today we have a country not boiling in an agony of blood, if now we have a united country no longer cursed by the hell-black system of human bondage, if the American name is no longer a byword and a hissing to the mocking earth, if the star-spangled banner floats only over free American citizens in every quarter of the land, and our country has before it a long and glorious career of justice, liberty, and civilization, we are indebted to the unselfish devotion of the noble army who rest in these honored graves all around us. I thought that was excellent because a lot of people, of course, have heard of Frederick Douglass, but you know, if, if you give speeches like that, um, you're going to be remembered. I mean, yeah. that's just right to the heart. And, and what's uh, painful about it is it's almost true today. The same, same issues, the same issues. It's almost the same problem. Why is it? And, and I thought it was interesting to see how he said our reputation in the world you know, was saved by us stopping this. And it's hard for Americans to put themselves back in that position. I think you have to kind of think of what South Africa was like when apartheid was still running and everybody in the, in the, during the Vietnam War and the 70s, everybody was so like, you can't do this anymore, you can't do this anymore. Um, because we, the, I mean, the Brits had already outlawed slavery and so on and so forth, and we just kept going and kept going and kept going for a couple more decades. So I think the similarity is fairly, fairly concrete. It's interesting that the, that the cemeteries were, were, were the focus of that death was part of Look, this is how bad it is. We have to do something about it. The other thing that was interesting about your thing was how segregation in cemeteries, which was just taken for granted for a long time, was also something that was started to be pushed back on by the military after World War II with Truman, right? So why don't you talk about a little bit about segregation in cemeteries and then, you know, we don't, we don't remember it because I think at least that is mostly gone. You, you said there are a couple of cemeteries that still are segregated, but very few. Yeah, there there is still segregation among the dead. Uh, mm. But what's what's fascinating is is how visceral the the record is of segregation uh, through cemeteries because you have the gravestones there, you have the the actual evidence in front of you. Whether that is uh, the the segregated cemeteries of the South or even in the West um, with a lot of Chinese immigrants mm -hmm. and, and uh, the cemeteries where Chinese immigrants were often placed in, uh, were only allowed to be buried in potter's fields or uh, in certain segregated sections of cemeteries. And so, uh, yeah, I, 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 one place that I visit is a cemetery that is divided in, in Savannah, Georgia, that is literally has a, a an interstate that dry that that has been paved through the black and the white side uh, of the cemetery mm -hmm. and uh, the upkeep of the historically white side that filled up in the early 20th century is immaculate uh, but the resources that go to the historically black side which is still active today is, is clearly a fraction of what uh, has been given to the other side yeah, you, um, you talk also about uh, like Tombstone, Arizona, uh, which is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for, for the Chinese things. And uh, you have, you, you quoted uh, one of the, the sayings there. Why don't you, you want to tell that story? I think that's one of the best, best things I've ever seen written on a, on a tombstone. That's just too good, too good to be true <laughs> almost. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're putting me on the spot, but I got it. Okay, um, good. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I tell the story of a Western Union agent named Lester Moore, who was held up one day by some, some bandits, by a bandit. And, and the, the, the Boot Hill cemeteries of the West, they were named that because so many people died with their boots on in violent ways, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, the epitaphs can be pretty funny uh, because the people were so close to death. Death mm -hmm. was such a part of their daily lives. So there, the, the, the epitaph for Lester Moore, it's uh, here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. <laughs> so. Uh. I hope Lester enjoyed that. <laughs> I, I, I'm assuming that they thought Lester would would appreciate that. But yeah, the, the, the Boot Hills uh, often had a very grim humor to them mm. with the epitaphs, yeah. for sure. Um, so you talk about uh, Central Park. That's a park. But also in New York, then after they made a park, then they started to make other parks. But they made other parks right where the old cemeteries were. About the only other thing that you can think of that's turned into a park in big cities is uh, like old railroad areas or right of ways or something like that where mm -hmm. that gets all pulled up and then that gets turned into a park because uh, where else are you going to get the land for a park right. in a crowded city? Um, right. But it is interesting to think that, that you know, so many of the famous parks in New York are actually former burial grounds. Do they move yeah. all of, the, all of the, the graves or do they just leave them underground or is it just a combination of that? You know? Oh, they left them there. They left them there. They, they, oh, they generally oh, they did. Yeah. yeah, and you'll find that in Philadelphia. You'll find that in, in Lincoln Park in Chicago. Uh, you'll find it out at Cheeseman Park in Denver. And then, of course, even in San Francisco, you think mm -hmm. about the, the turn of the 20th century when all the graves were moved to Colma. Mm -hmm. Although the plan was to move all the graves, uh, clearly that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But in the case of New York City, a lot of those uh, parks were on, were Potter's Fields. They didn't have enough regard for the people there to uh, to move the, the bodies, so they just largely built the parks on top of them. Um, you, when you when you uh, talk about uh, Potter's Fields a little bit earlier, that's another another element to this poor people. Um, but before before we go there, I wanted to mention one more thing, which is Trinity Church. You you mentioned something that I thought was very striking because I've I've been in the Trinity Church. Uh, Cemetery, which is still one of the few cemeteries, is right down the middle of Wall Street area. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, little land for the, and and what's funny about Trinity Church is it used to be the lighthouse for the area. I mean, nobody could see anything from the the t steeple of Trinity Church anymore with all the buildings around it. But anyway, you said there's only a hundred markers, but there's a hundred thousand people buried there. Where 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 are they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, they're one on top of the other. Yeah. Um, that was one of the reasons for burial reform in New York City was uh -huh. the Trinity Churchyard because they couldn't dig very deep to put the bodies. So oftentimes it was just throwing dirt on top of them. And the, the odor, people were afraid of catching disease from the odors. They were afraid of mm. the water being poisoned. And people in the surrounding blocks used to say that that the smell would change the color of their walls and their their drapes oh, wow. which i don't know if that was true but you can you can just imagine how disgusting that 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 was mm -hmm. uh so let's go back to the potter's fields and potter's fields good name for poor cemeteries people who are poor don't have a name unknown people that kind of thing um but you said the one on Hart Island, just outside of uh, New York City, um, that 100,000 victims of AIDS were, were buried there? From, yeah, from the AIDS, from the AIDS mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, epidemic in, in the 1980s? Wow. Yeah, it's, uh, it's still the largest burial ground for AIDS victims in the world. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, then, and they've also used it for the victims of uh, COVID as well. Yeah, and so the the images were very famous. Someone had taken uh, aerial shots of inmates digging mass graves at Hart Island and uh, burying people, uh, a substantial percentage of people who died in the first, uh, eight, uh, the first COVID wave in New York City ended up being buried there because of either lack of resources or uh, because the infrastructure couldn't handle uh, mm. traditional burials. Yeah. Yeah, it's now that, of course, the problem has been solved for, not solved, but, but uh, modified tremendously for AIDS, um, but people don't remember that that was basically a death sentence uh, if you, you had it. I mean, the, the, the death rate was in the 90% uh, range, something like that. Um, but it also, you know, it, it, it really, it strikes at um, this idea that, 
cemeteries are these unfiltered lenses through which we look we can look at ourselves right. how we treat the dead says so much about us and obviously the bigotry that went into um burying aids victims on an island in a potter's field in the 1980s says undeniably a lot about our society yeah so We'll leave the East Coast for a little while because you did. Okay. We, 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 we did mention Tombstone, Arizona, but you did Tombstone on the way to California, and California has had its own unique approach to, uh, to uh, everything, uh, including cemeteries. <laughs> yeah. And as an East Coaster, you can, you can now uh, tell us all about how we did this and how, 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 uh, how California looks. I, I love well, you, L.A. and San Francisco, so there you yeah. go. Yeah. And, uh, and both play really important roles. So the Bay Area was essential in kind of making cremation mainstream, mm -hmm. uh, which was huge, massively important in the, the turn of the 20th century, because today more Americans are cremated than they are buried. And that's been a statistic that, that the, a majority of people in the Bay Area have been buried, uh, uh, cremated rather than buried since the 1990s. But now that's that's true all, all across the country. And uh, and then also uh, in Los Angeles, uh, it has changed the business. The, the burial ground there changed the actual business of death in the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, say how the one in, in Los Angeles changed it and, uh, and, and also inspired Disney at the same time. That's really quite a trick to pull off. Sure. So in 1917, a forest lawn memorial park uh, in Glendale was founded and the creator wanted to basically create this country club. He wanted it to be a place where it would be easy to sell graves mm -hmm. uh, and he, he wanted to market things to the living. So he and he also wanted to make it easy to, to maintain. So he created a cemetery that had no no stones that were standing up. They all had to be embedded in the ground. And uh, he really corporatized the idea of burial. He, he pre-sold plots, which was really an innovation at the time. He marketed uh, the cemetery as being a place where you could have security into eternity. So he, had, he, he, he did newspaper ads and billboards or posted ads on billboards. And then also uh, he created these halls of art where the largest painting of Christ is held. Mm -hmm. And he had a massive statue of David and it became this place where people would go to just marvel mm -hmm. at the, the works, of this combination of the flag and, and art and Christianity and green space. Um, to the point where it became the most popular tourist attraction in California for about three decades. If you think about um, uh, a, a, a theme park as being a, a attraction that is based around a specific theme, uh, the very first one is credited as being Knott's Berry Farm in California, but this was created before that. And the actual layout of it was inspired Walt Disney in creating Disneyland mm -hmm. and Walt Disney is now buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park mm -hmm. and um, Disneyland in the 1950s then overtook Forest Lawn as California's most popular tourist attraction. It's interesting because here in the Bay Area we always say that uh, children's fairyland in, in, in Oakland was the inspiration for Disney um, but, but uh, I think the scale and everything else that you're talking about about Forest Lawn makes it clear that at least that was probably the bigger influence. Yeah, yeah there are these cottages where uh, that that look like they're from Snow White, where you can that are that are chapels. Like one's called Wee Kirk of the Heather, and Ronald Reagan was married there in 1940. And uh, the the they don't have trash cans, or the trash cans are disguised as as logs, mm -hmm. so that uh, and they have a PA systems that are just like Disney that were created before. Disneyland came up and all the sections have different names that sound very Disney-esque mm -hmm. and it's and clearly with Disney being buried there this was a place that uh, he knew intimately well interesting that people would get married you know in in a cemetery that's, right that's planning ahead you know and no wonder the yeah. marriage failed <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, let's 
let's move north here to Chapel of the Chimes. You know, you, you, you talked a little bit about it. It was uh, designed by Julia Morgan. We, we happen to be doing a program on a book on Julia Morgan nec next month in uh, December here. Uh, there's a new book out on, on her accomplishments. But people pay a little attention to her around here. But as you said, you know, she's been ignored a little bit. She's not well known, as well known as Frank Lloyd Wright, those kind of guys, but she really did a tremendous amount of work as the first uh, female architect that had so much stuff done. So why don't you tell a little about the story? It wasn't her idea or anything, but, but uh, what she did, I've been there myself, um, and I, 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 it really is a tremendous artistic accomplishment as you talked about it. I think why don't you, you're, in your tour of it, it was great, you know, the, the, the way you wrote about your tour of it. Uh, yeah, because... Uh <laughs> it's this place that has basically it, it's a columbarium. It holds largely cremated remains in the, that are instead of traditional urns, they're shaped like books. Mm -hmm. And I can get to that. But you walk around and you're basically surrounded by the remains of 30,000 people as you're walking these halls. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that idea kind of strikes you, it, it does. And you're there walking alone through this this place where the your feet your your footsteps echo through the halls mm -hmm. it does become i have to say a little creepy yeah I, I figure after doing this with all the cemeteries in the world this was the place that was creepiest to you right yeah it freaked me out a little the, the morning that that i went that i described in in the book yeah i was yeah. uh I was texting a friend as i was going through there uh um for <laughs> for support and comfort as i was walking through but it is an amazing place uh, just remarkable yeah it said she, she the way she designed it, and, and uh, as you said, there's no, cop, there's no pathways, everything. One area moves on to the next, and you felt almost that you could get lost in it, even though it's not very big, as you said, not yeah. very big. And it's also clever that it's right in front of the, the big cemetery so that people could walk by it. And as, yes. you, as, as you described in your book, and you say, as they walked by the crematorium on their way to the burial cemetery, they could get the idea that there was a warmer alternative to burial. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope that pun was okay. <laughs> that pun was just great. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, um, yeah, like you said, Julia Morgan is she was so underappreciated, but she yeah. created basically by creating the Chapel of the Chimes. She she took uh, cremation from seeming like something that was perceived at that time as being like an atheistic act mm -hmm. and made it holy, mm -hmm. made it something that was religious, which was really a a massive attitude change uh, mm -hmm. in the United States. It's interesting, you also make the comment that that's what art does. You, you, by an image, an art, the creation of a different way of looking at something visually, you can talk all about it, you know, and, and you can talk to it and 10,000 people will get it. But if you create a visual image that changes everyone's perception pretty soon, you know, it's, it's, it changes the way everybody thinks about it. I mean, there's so many different things that have changed in American society in terms of how, what percentage of the people accept things, in, in, in this case, cremation. It's, no one would have expected cremation to have been accepted when my parents were younger. And boom, you know? I mean, you talk about segregated uh, cemeteries. My, my hometown, the segregation is between Catholics and Lutherans. You know, and I, yeah. I think that that's true in, in lots of places too. That, that the cemeteries, it's all part of the same cemetery, but there's a line right down and then one's named one thing, one's named the other, and, the families all keep separate as they did in in, uh, in real life, and uh, you know that those kind of divisions and identity have have not disappeared, but that's not an important identity. There's many many other identities that people now identify with that are much more important than that. So it's yeah. fascinating how that imagery and the change using art just completely shifts a, a society's image over multiple multiple things. So yeah. it's fascinating to see it done with cemeteries too. Now, so we talk about the big issue, where are cemeteries headed? Because cemeteries are, are, are having a problem. You talked about that in a, in, in a way which was fascinating. You, know, you, you, you talked about the financial gains of splitting up a piece of land into smaller and smaller plots, but then when you have cremation, it can be even smaller. But now, what, what's, you know, it, it sounds a little bit like you know, the Silicon Valley chip market where everything has to get smaller and smaller and smaller doing the same thing. Um, so does every year and a half, does it double in, in, <laughs> in value the way, the way our, our chip industry works? Or no, not, not quite like that. But what's happening to, to, to uh, cemeteries is very interesting. Now, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, so cemeteries, although they are generally nonprofits, which means they're tax-free, you know, they, they're not paying property tax, they're not necessarily charities. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, can, you can make a lot of money off of 
splitting one acre into a thousand parcels. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it takes a long time to fill up those thousand parcels, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why uh, Forest Lawn uh, innovated pre-sale. But now with so many people being cremated uh, and only about 30% of people who are cremated choose to have their remains placed into a cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, although that's, very, that's opening up kind of new areas for cemeteries that are full because they can build a columbarium wall mm -hmm. uh, that takes a very little space and can be very profitable. Cemeteries really are in a lot of ways in a struggle for survival. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they're, it's very difficult to maintain the funds uh, that are needed to keep the grounds up, especially in places that are already full and have been full for a couple of generations. Uh, and now with people's changing tastes, especially with the notion of digital immortality, mm -hmm. uh, changing how people want to have their memories preserved. Great. If there's any questions for Greg, um, you can put it right into the uh, chat box on our YouTube channel. So, um, but yeah, digital immortality. I mean, you mentioned this fantasy that, that some people in Silicon Valley have that we'll all upload ourselves into a computer instead of, and, and, and be immortal that way. But, but uh, you, you mentioned the more concrete version, which is uh, the, the Facebook or anything else, your digital memories, and that's what people are going to turn to when people have a celebration of someone's life now. They usually have a a slideshow, uh, videos, and, and, and pictures, and stuff like that. And that seems a little bit easier to, to remember the life rather than the death. But, you, right. you, you, but you, this has been part of the business that you're talking about when you talk about the business part of this for a long time, because you, you said life insurance started as burial insurance. Right, which, exactly. And then they changed the name to make it more, you know, to make it a little bit sound nicer, right? Right, yeah. And uh, the, the the living room and houses used to be the death room. Right. Uh, and I can't imagine, uh, you know, wanting to watch the big game in, a, in, in the death room. <laughs> I'm glad they changed that to the, to the living room. But one, when death left the home and, and entered into funeral homes, the, the death room was usually the death room or the parlor. And then mm -hmm. it became the funeral parlor. Mm -hmm. And that commodification of death really occurred after the Civil War, when all of these professionals who had been hired by the federal government to help preserve and ship home uh, the dead of the Civil War and uh, use embalming for the first time, then turn their services outward towards the general public. It's also interesting, interesting point, you know, you have a lot of different angles on this thing. Uh, but the interesting point you make about the fact that embalming and uh, the way that it's been done for the, since the Civil War uh, is environmentally destructive and that, and that cremation isn't all that much better, you know, because uh, it, it takes so much energy to, to uh, completely incinerate a body. Right, right. They, they say that the, the carbon footprint is roughly the same as driving 700 miles mm -hmm. in a car uh, in the United States with the, the fossil fuels that are used for cremation, mm -hmm. which is why uh, natural burial alternatives are really starting to arise in, in places, especially like Marin County is, is a place that's really one of the leaders in um, the natural death movement. But that's going right back to where we were with the pilgrims, you know, and, and uh, that, that will, of course, lead to problems if there's too many bodies and, and they, they, all, they leach out. But maybe they won't be leaching out embalming fluid anymore. But, but uh, right. obviously disease has always been a problem with, with rotting corpses that has always been something that any urban area has had to deal with. So, yes. So this can't get sure. too big. Of, this movement can't get too big, at least in, in urban areas. Well, it depends on on um, the methods that are used. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, California has is recently one of the five states that is moving towards full legalization of human composting, mm -hmm. uh, and there are other uh, other reduction methods uh, that that speed up decomposition and are are less uh, intrusive to the environment that uh, people are innovating with now, uh, which is which is really interesting. You know, when you mentioned all that, I was thinking, you know, maybe the Burning Man uh, should should move into this area out in the desert, you know, because you could you could probably have quite a, a few, um, you know, bodies buried naturally under the desert. That would be a fairly quick process. Um, 
you mentioned other things that, that are kind of outrageous of what's going on, which is you know, that, that people, and, and this we haven't mentioned yet, so it's a great, great thing to talk about, um, how cemeteries used famous people to make their cemeteries popular. Sure. Okay, so we can, we can go right to France. <laughs> uh, the, the, the famous uh, c- cemetery, I'll let you pronounce it, that uh, Jim Morrison is, is uh, buried in. And, yes, and, uh, uh, Père Lachaise. Yeah. yeah. And, and he, they, they bought the bodies for, of, of, of Moliere and Heloise, Eloise and, and Abelard, who yes. had died, they died in the tw- 1200s. And, you know, Moliere, yeah. well, I don't know, 1700, 1800, something like that. And they bought their thing to put them in the, in the cemetery to make their cemetery popular, and it worked. I yes. find that fascinating. <laughs> because it was such a foreign concept. So Père Lachaise mm-hmm. before um, Mount Auburn in Massachusetts, they were the first, it, because of the burial problems at uh, a couple of famous uh, cemeteries in Paris that had to be emptied out and the, the bones were put in the, in the catacombs in Paris because mm-hmm. they tried to get people there. They, they, they decided to have celebrities uh, mm-hmm. at the 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 new burial ground outside of the churchyards and so yeah they had Moliere and Abelard and Heloise now and, and that that has been imitated by other people all along but I, I thought you know that maybe a perfect place to end would be to say how somebody took advantage of owning the spot right next to Marilyn Monroe because I just yeah. I just find that you know that, that, that there's something so American about that <laughs> yes yes <laughs> And uh, it, it, there is a secondary market for graves right. on a eBay. secondary and, market and, for and, graves. On, yeah. yeah. Okay. So tell us about that. And what, what, and, did, what did the spot, you know, the, the, somebody owned the spot right above Marilyn Monroe's grave. Right. What, what, is, so, is it, was she cremated or is she buried in the wall or? Uh, she, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a tomb. So she is, she's, she's placed in the wall. Yeah. And so it was the spot right above her. I, I believe it was on, uh, on, eBay that uh, the person uh, actually won the won the uh, the auction for it, mm-hmm. uh, and so and, and got the right uh, in the millions of dollars to be buried uh, or to to have the spot above Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, as I as I remember just having read it yesterday, four point nine million dollars in order to be buried above Marilyn Monroe for the rest of eternity. That shows that shows a little bit of delusion about what happens after you die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that was great, uh, Greg. Very interesting book. Um, and you, we were talking before about, about how you came up with this arc to talk about it. And you did a great job of, of telling so many cultural stories through the lens of, of our cemeteries and how influential those ideas were to both launch ideas and to end ideas. And it, it makes us look at it and say, okay, so where this, this, this is something that could be a, an anomaly of you know the 1500s to the 2100s or something like that, and people will look back and say, "What were people thinking of?" Well, they didn't realize we didn't have you know 25 billion people on the planet at the time, probably <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. So thanks a lot for joining us at the Commonwealth Club, and, and uh, hope everything goes well with the sales of the book. It was a very interesting <laughs> read. Thanks. I, I really enjoyed the talk. I really appreciate uh, being here to talk to you. Great. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club, and it's uh, 120th year of enlightened discussion. See you again.